person today. Um, it's an honor to be here with Ara and Lindsay, who are my co-ambassadors, and special thanks to Donnell, Maddie, and Aaron for all the behind-the-scenes work. Um, for those of you who participate in the PRS Journal Club live event, it's uh, we're proud to continue the tradition, and because of your engagement, the PRS Journal Club has been really a recipient of multiple awards. Uh, Best Online Community Award two years in a row. We're happy to announce that the podcast won the Apex Award of Publication Excellence in Podcasts. So again, thanks to Dr. Warwick and Donnell, Maddie, Aaron, everyone else um, for all of your help with this. Here are classic pairings for the article that we'll be discussing today. So feel free to read these articles online for free. The session is being recorded and released as a special video and podcast on PRS channels. So uh, be sure to tune in. And um, I think it's a very special day for me and for everyone. Uh, these are three of my mentors at MSK. Um, so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the speakers today. Dr. Marara is the Chief of Plastic Surgery at MSK and the Peter Cordero Endowed Chair. And in all of his free time, he runs a R01 NIH funded lab. So um, thanks for being here, Dr. Marara. Dr. Disa is uh, the Benno Schmidt uh, Endowed Chair in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And his specialization includes pretty much all aspects of oncologic microvascular reconstruction. And he's also the section editor of Breast, so it's, it's uh, great to have him here today. And then, of course, Dr. Nelson is a friend and a mentor. He's also an attending. He runs the clinical research program and, and oversees this empire of research uh, fellows at MSK. And I think you'll recognize his name on all the upcoming Annals of Surgery and PRS articles on this topic and ontologous reconstruction. So uh, thank you all for, for being here. And Lindsay James, one of my co-ambassadors, will summarize the article we'll be discussing. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to the authors uh, for being here today for our live journal club. To get us started, I'd like to briefly summarize the article for those in the audience who haven't had a chance to read it fully yet. The goal of this article was to compare both patient-reported outcomes and complication profiles in a large cohort of patients who underwent post-mastectomy breast reconstruction using textured or smooth breast implants. The authors hypothesized that there would be no difference in outcomes between textured and smooth implants. They reviewed electronic medical records between January 2009 and July 2017, including women 18 or older who underwent immediate breast reconstruction with tissue expanders and subsequent exchange to smooth or textured silicone breast implants following prophylactic or therapeutic mastectomy. 1,077 patients were included in the final analysis, 785 with smooth implants and 292 with textured implants. Patient demographics were well matched between groups with the exception that patients who underwent reconstruction with textured implants were more likely than smooth implant recipients to have a slightly lower average BMI and a lower rate of postoperative radiotherapy. No statistical differences were observed between the textured and smooth implant groups for any of the breast Q domain scores during the early three month to late two year postoperative time points. Looking at complication rates, overall there was a higher rate of any complication, revision, or reoperation in the textured implant group. Smooth implants had a higher rate of moderate and severe rippling, and textured implants had a significantly higher rate of cellulitis. Also notable, rates of capsular contrapture were not notably different between groups. With that, I think we'll open it up for the Q&A portion. Uh, please line up to ask your questions. We will, again, as a reminder, we are recording the lecture and Q&A to post it on PRS and PRS Global Open websites and social media channels. If you do not wish to be in the video but still wish to ask a question, find one of the team after the event. I can start maybe with Dr. Nelson. Um, can you comment um, on kind of you know, prepectoral reconstruction is something we hear all the time now, and this study was done a little bit earlier. Can you comment maybe on the plane of reconstruction um, and if you think that might have affected some of the outcomes and thinking more about textured implants and prepectoral plane, if that could have changed some of the things that you all saw? Yeah, so the uh, study cohort was basically from 2009 to 2017. We really started utilizing the prepectoral technique around that 2017, 2018 mark. Um, Dr. Disa certainly is doing a fair amount and started doing that at that point in time. But this cohort is really in the, the subpectoral plane. Um, about 50% or so had ADM utilized, okay. um, so do but they still were in the subpectoral plane okay. for the most part. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
you know, in, in, with subpectral, I think you have your, your implant pocket, you know, it's defined a little bit more. And one of the things with texturing and implants moving in the prepectoral plane, you know, might have some more relevance. Do you think in prepec patients, I mean, I imagine people aren't putting in textured implants now, but in prepec patients, things like capsular contracture, implant malposition, which can affect patient satisfaction, might become more of an issue. Uh, absolutely, and I think that's you know, one of the, the, the main ideas behind the textured device was to control the placement a bit more, control the capsule. Uh, and so the idea with, with in potentially being able to utilize that in the prepectoral space where you may have a bit more movement of your device, I think is, is, is real. But I think with the challenges with the textured devices, uh, certainly with ALCL, that dialogue, you have to bring, bring that up and really consider uh, heavily whether or not it's worth utilizing a textured device in that situation. Yeah, yeah definitely. Hi, thank you all so much. Uh, very interesting paper. I was kind of following up on uh, that question um, with textured implants. Uh, now that you know that the FDA has kind of come out and there's the, the recall with some of the textured devices, um, what are you all seeing in terms of patients coming back? Um, in terms of undergoing explantation of textured devices or um, wanting to undergo monitored surveillance and maybe what is your protocol um, for counseling those patients and working them up? Thank you. I'll take that one. Um, I, I tell my patients that they need to be seen and they need to be followed and that ALCL is relatively uncommon and that as long as the FDA is telling me that I don't have to explain those patients. That's what I'd share with the patients. With that said, if the patient has an aesthetic issue, she doesn't like the way the implant looks or feels, this is a great opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. You can get rid of the textured implant and put the smooth implant in. Um, I find that when I, uh, I stopped using anatomically shaped form stable textured implants before the voluntary recall. Uh, because I wasn't happy with the outcomes. They were hard. When you have a breast reconstruction patient, whether it's sub or pre yeah, the shape may be good, <clears throat> but the soft tissue envelope over that device is relatively thin, and I found patients were complaining that they were cold, particularly in the cold weather. Um, they were hard, and then I would see late device rotations not uncommonly. And as a result of that, I started using the, those devices less and less and started using more and more smooth devices. And patients like them because they are a little softer, they're a little bit more movable, a little bit more comfortable, and they're easier for your body to warm them up. Um, so, I mean, the downside's rippling, the upsides are some of the comfort factors. Uh, but with all of that, my count, I say to patients, as long as you're coming in every two years, as long as you're getting your MRIs every three years, if you have a silicone device, and as long as you show up in the office, if you get a late seroma or a mass or something and let us, uh, uh, you know, take care of it right away, then that's, you know, you don't need to take them out unless you really want to. Dr. Disa, just to follow up on that, it might be tough to put a number to it, but are the majority of patients that you're coming in and counseling deciding just to monitor or flip to try and get them out? Like, what's the general? In my practice, it's monitor. monitor. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's important when we think, talk about the, this study in particular that uh, although we're comparing smooth and textured devices, uh, the, the actual decision or that we're trying to sort of help with is not upfront whether or not we should put in a smooth or a textured device currently. Uh, we really wanted to do this to just be able to say, okay, did the devices, was there a difference in patient reported outcomes, was there a difference in complications from the device itself, now that we have concerns about the textured devices with ALCL, to help us guide potentially the next step for patients who may decide to not just do monitoring, who may decide to take that next step, at least we can maybe say, if you do an exchange, will your device itself cause there to be a change in your satisfaction? Now, this study itself certainly didn't address that, and that's a whole nother, no, whole nother area of, of examination. But the point was really to say, device itself, 
is there potentially a difference or is there not? Uh, I also make a distinction between macro uh, texture devices and micro texture devices. So I think I'm a little bit more aggressive about removing uh, micro macro texture devices, uh, particularly if they don't look good, as Joe said, uh, versus micro texture devices. Hi, I'm Emily Long. I'm at Beth Israel. Um, one of the interesting outcomes of the study was that there was a significant. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There was a significant difference in the rippling and the smooth implants. How do you counsel patients on this preoperatively, and what steps do you take to prevent rippling, whether alder and fat grafting or the texture of the implant? Well, I can talk about that. Um, I, I tend to, um, I, you know, I think an important thing is to talk to them about implant size. So if you can upsize the implant a little bit, I think that decreases the rippling. I do tend to use the form cohesive implants more now than I used to. So the, um, the, the ones that are a little bit more cohesive, I think, have less rippling. I tighten the, the capsule a lot if I, if I can. Uh, and then I do a lot more fat grafting than I used to. So I think well, I do all of those things. And I, I would just like to say I agree with all of that. I, I, the one thing that I have noticed, particularly in pre-PEC reconstruction patients with smooth, highly cohesive devices, is that they tend to flip. And when they flip, it's really noticeable because the back of the device is flat and the front of the device is round. And patients need to be consoled that you know, they, even if you do all of that, the weight of the implant can stretch out the pocket over time and you can get a flipping device. Whereas the less form stable devices that ripple a little bit more tend to flip less. So you've got to weigh the pros and cons. I, I found flipping with, with all of them and it's a bad problem. You know, I think we went from capsular contracture to malposition uh, being a bigger problem than, than, uh, than it was. So it's a problem. It's hard to fix. In those cases, I sometimes go back to using a microtextured device. Dr. Nelson, can you comment on the findings related to radiation in the study and how that affects your clinical practice specifically? So um, in our examination of sort of our, our long-term patient-reported outcomes uh, in both satisfaction with breast as well as physical well-being of the chest, radiation was one of the strongest factors for negative uh, or decreases in, in score. Uh, Specifically, in, in this study, we did subgroup analyses looking at the patients who had radiation and patients who didn't. About a quarter of the patients had radiation. Uh, there were, again, no differences between the textured and smooth in either of those cohorts. But on the multivariate regression, radiation was still, again, found to be one of the, one of the most significant predictors of a negative impact of score. So I definitely counsel my patients uh, preoperatively just that. I counsel them that radiation will significantly affect you and will affect you in the long term. There may be nothing that you can do about that, but we, it's our goal and our, our role in that preoperative counsel, consultation as well as as we care for our patients to just help them understand what their process is going to be like. Setting expectations is really important. We can't necessarily impact the results that they're going to have uh, with regards to how their own body responds to the radiation, but if we can help them understand things a little bit better, I think that's, that's helpful. If subsequently there are things that we can do surgically, whether it be fat grafting, a revision procedure, to help improve that satisfaction, certainly that is, those are options we consider as well. I think um, something that we plastic surgeons need to do that we have not done is to quantify the effect of radiation on quality of life for years. Uh, uh, in these patients because, you know, truthfully, no one really cares about breast cue uh, outside of plastic surgery. And, and I think we need to uh, get the message out that this really has an effect on quality of life years as opposed to just overall satisfaction with a, with a, with a reconstruction. And, and I think that's a bigger message than, than being satisfied or not satisfied because these patients have terrible uh, problems. I see them a lot with lymphedema. We see patients who have you know, no range of motion, severe lymphedema, and these are patients who had low risk for lymphedema to begin with. And with the viral sort of proliferation of radiation in this patient setting, I think it's, uh, we're obligated to do that. And I think probably a multi-centered trial with plastic surgeons looking at quality of life years uh, as an outcome measure would be a really important thing to do because, you know, the, the idea that uh, you reduce the risk of recurrence by 50%, 4% to 2%, is oversold to patients. So they say that's what they say to patients, but it's really 4% to 2%. And then you end up getting patients who have micrometastases to lymph nodes, getting the option of having radiation. And you know, which patient, how many patients are going to say, oh no, I, I don't want that option because I, I don't, I'm not, I'm fine with it. 
Um, so I think that message needs to get out, and, and I think that probably 20 years from now we'll look back and, and think, uh, my gosh, we really did over-radiate this patient population. Uh, and I think we'll probably still end up be taking care of these patients in 20 years from now because, you know, as you all know, these, these problems tend to get worse over time, uh, not just one or two years, uh, but really 10 or 15 years down the line. So we'll see lots of angiosarcomas, and we see, we'll see lots and lots of problems as the years to come. But I think we all, plastic surgeons need to get together and, and we need to have a trial to look at uh, the effects on quality of life years and uh, other uh, factors in, in addition to breast Q. Thanks, Dr. Mara. Those are great points. It's a little off topic, but to follow up on that, have you seen any differences in quality of life um, that with pre-PEC patients and radiation with you were mentioning pain, fibrosis, PEC fibrosis with the implant above the muscle? In, patients that are getting pre-PEC recons? You know, I, I'm still fairly new to the uh, pre-PEC game. I, I've only done it for like the last couple of years and I'm yeah. pretty selective on who I do it with, so mm -hmm. I, I don't have a great number of experience with that. Um, Joe, and, Joe, and, uh, Joe and Jonas probably have more experience with that, so maybe they can comment on that. I would say that radiated pre-PEC patients generally do a little bit better than with less fibrosis and less discomfort than mm -hmm. the radiated subpec patients, but with that assuming said, the implant stays in. <laughs> with that said, minor detail. With yeah. that said, pre-pec reconstruction is either a win or lose proposition. Yeah. You either win yeah. or you lose, and you're going to lose a lot more often with a pre-pec because there's That's no good. forgiveness yeah. than with a subpec. A minor amount of breakdown, and they're going to get infected or get exposed, and you're going to act, they're going to have a reconstructive yeah. failure. Yeah. I have a quick question for my colleagues here. T what are your thoughts about microtextured tissue expanders, and do you use them? I don't use them, but I should because I hate the smooth tissue expanders. They, they I, I can't stand them. You know, they, they float around. Uh, so uh, I, I don't use them, but I should in the primordial soup. Yeah, I, I use them actually, and uh, I like them. We, we have a hive mind at MSK. We all sort of come to the same decisions pretty much all at the same time. So <laughs> Joe and I stopped using textured implants at the, at the same time. We actually didn't discuss it. It was just that the, the Klingon hive mind mentality that took over. <laughs> yeah, I, I also don't, uh, I don't use them. I think that, that there's definitely a, a role for them, and I think that there's still a, a big question of, did we maybe swing a little bit too far in uh, the direction away from all texture devices? Um, the question of does a short exposure to a textured tissue expander, does that, how does that play into risk of, of ALCL? I think that question has, has not been definitively answered. Um, but I think potentially using the microtextured uh, devices uh, is, is worth looking into. Couple questions from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Hi guys, Sammy Othman, Northwell Health. Uh, you had talked about fat grafting a little before, and on the topic of radiation, for patients who are pre-radiated, and then you want to fat graft them later on, I imagine the take is probably a little bit worse. Do you have any strategies for combating that, or do you use alternative methods of treatment, or what is your approach for those types of patients? I typically don't uh, fat graft before radiation because I think it's a losing proposition. Um, after radiation, you know, it, it sort of it really depends on how good the tissues look. If it's if it looks like a piece of wood, it's going to stay a piece of wood. Um, in patients who have uh, less severe reactions to radiation, I find that uh, fat grafting into the pec muscle is actually much better than fat grafting into the subcutaneous plane. So I I put the majority of my fat grafts into the pec muscle if I can. Uh, or the serratus, if the, if it's open, uh, so I think that that helps me a lot. But you know, it sort of it, it really depends a lot on the degree of damage that occurred with radiation. And part of the problem is that the radiation oncologists have gotten much better at um, at avoiding the uh, uh, intrathoracic organs. So that means that they're getting a lot bigger dose to the skin. I mean, they're giving the same dose, so it's got to go someplace. Uh, and I think that's why we see a lot more damage in some cases. For example, you know, I've had a terrible experience with proton radiation in some of my patients, and, and that's been a problem because I think they're giving the same dose, but it's all, it's all getting absorbed by the skin, and, and, and some patients do very badly with that. So I think you really have to look at it on an individual case basis. If it, if it doesn't look good and if the skin is completely fibrosed, you're not going to change that with, with fat grafting, and there's no point even trying. 
um, if, the, uh, if the degree of damage is not so severe, then trying these alternative methods of fat grafting into the muscle may help. And in those very damaged patients, they need the ultimate frat, fat graft, which is an autologous reconstruction. Malka Assad from the University of Pittsburgh. Great discussion. I want to uh, closer. What are your thoughts about the use of implant-based breast reconstruction, tissue expander, or implants, smooth, textured, uh, in pre-pectoral pain without ADM? I'll take that. So I've been, I've got a, a growing series of pre-pectoral tissue expanders without ADM. I, if, as long as the skin flaps are okay, I don't see where you need it. I need some time to get some longer follow-up on that. Um, I think the ADM manufacturers would like you to believe that you need it with every case. Um, but if, if, what are you using it for is the question. If you're using it to control the pocket, well, okay, fine. But that's what the tabs are there for on your tissue expanders. Now, with that said, if you're doing a direct implant breast reconstruction after a mastectomy, unless the patient's had a prior AUG and you're going back into that AUG pocket, if it's a neo patient, you need some ADM to help control the device so it doesn't fall out into the axilla or bottom out or whatever. Uh, but with tab tissue expanders, I very selectively use it, but more often than not, in a prepack, I'm not using ADM. Dr. Disa, I think it's a great point. We tried looking at that in just short-term data too, but no ADM, ADM with tab tissue expanders and short-term, and it's all the same. You know, there's no, your, your tabs are taking your pressure off the mastectomy flaps, your implant pocket can be defined. Right. Um, the thing we haven't gotten or tried to figure out is like the capsular contracture game and the rippling game. I don't know if you've, our patients weren't far, far out enough to get there. There is some data out of Rochester that showed lower rates, but I don't know. And then you get into the argument of, do you believe the ADM capsular contracture? Yeah. Right, and those are all questions that are not really well answered. And you know, it's interesting that I just reviewed a paper for the journal um, that was sort of one of these systematic reviews, and it kind of hinted at the fact that the papers who had authors that were on the payroll on the payroll <laughs> for the AD, ADM companies had much better outcomes than yeah. the papers had authors that weren't on the payroll. Yeah. Fascinating yeah, stuff. It is. And I think if you look temporarily at the use of, or the, even the papers published on ADM, where we're coming almost full circle kind of back to where we were. You know. it, it's a tool. It's yeah. a, it's a, it, there, you can do things in best reconstruction with ADM that you couldn't do without yeah. it. Yeah. But, and it's definitely a tool, but I don't think it's a panacea that you need it for every single case. Dr. Nelson, I don't know if we touched on this at all, but in the paper it talks about complication rate, textured versus smooth, but um, what are your thoughts as to what might, and, but then also that the cellulitis rate is higher in textured implants. Do you think that the complications are related to cellulitis infection, or why do you think that group had a higher complication rate? So I, I think that, that that specific variable was uh, a uh, a variable that included complications related to cellulitis as well as the number of revision procedures. Um, I think that the, the textured surface certainly can, uh, in, in theory, be, harbor bacteria a, a bit better potentially. So it, it could be uh, related to that. The other thing that is Im important uh, when considering that variable is that the time horizon or the, the follow-up period for the textured patients was actually longer. Uh, our ex experience with uh, smooth and textured uh, implants um, transitioned from mostly textured implants to smooth implants over time, mainly because Dr. Disa and Marara transitioned about the same uh, period. And so the follow-up was shorter for the smooth devices. As a result, if there's less follow-up time, there is a potential for that, that the complication complications could be, you know, over time, revision procedures more simply because they were followed for about a thousand more days. H having said that, though, uh, I've had a number of patients over the years who had recurrent infections with textured devices that went away when I switched them to smooth implants. So I I've definitely had that, uh, and, um, you know, I, I can't put a number on it, but I can think of at and least that five And that could be patients. related to the, just the textured surface, sort of, although the antibiotics were able to sort of right. quell things for a bit. It never right. it, it did clear. These are patients with fully, feel, fully healed implants, you know, two years out. Yeah, and I, I've learned this from Babic, and that's one of those things. If you have a patient who has a recurrent cellulitis late, 
and you, you put them on antibiotics, it gets better, it pops back up a couple months later. After that happens a couple times, you just need to suppress them and give it a shot of taking out the textured, wash out the pocket, put it in a smooth, and more often than not, it works. Yeah. Now I actually also put in a huge dose of antibiotics in the pocket, so I actually um, put in a, a gram of Vanco and some Gent and you know some shoes and whatever, <laughs> and all, all in the pocket, Not all the dust. Everything I have, I put everything in there. Um, in today's day of social media and everything with ALCL, have you noticed women coming in asking more questions about smooth versus textured implants, and how does this paper maybe change your conversation with them, or does it? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think um, it's, um, they, our patients are very well educated in, in, uh, about this, uh, and uh, you know, in, in most instances, I can't even talk about a textured implant with them, even if they're having a complication with a smooth implant. So I have a number of patients who, whose implant keeps on flipping, and we've done several operations to try and fix it and can't fix it because it sort of gets stretched out. In those cases, they still don't consider doing a, a textured uh, device, uh, even the micro-textured devices. We have time for one more audience question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, hi, this is Abbas Hassan, a postdoc at MD Anderson. And my question is, what are your thoughts on current uh, surgical risk calculators like the BRA? Is it influencing your decision making um, between choosing different surgical techniques? Your question was, um, was about using calculators uh, for complication risk, essentially, yeah. right? Um, I, I think that uh, such calculators like the, the BRA calculator, for example, I think that those are um, great, great tools to potentially help give patients a bit of an, of an estimate of, of, of where they stand, what is their potential risk. I think that some of the challenges with calculators to this point in time are the number of patients and the number of events that are being used to build the models. And so I think that that is something that we as a field can certainly move, move a bit further beyond. Um, in a multi-center way uh, to, to get better data to be able to build better essential risk calculators. And one of the things that is always, along with all the other th variables such as BMI, smoking, diabetes, age, breast size, there's always the variable of the mastectomy skin flaps in the breast surgeon and that's the variable that we can't control. Um, and some, some of our colleagues put us at higher risk for problems than others. I think uh, I think any paper that we write nowadays in plastic surgery that has odds ratios in it probably should have a model, uh, a model that actually takes into consideration the odds ratios and puts them together so that you can calculate a score based on combined risk factors. So I think any any situation where you have a, a multivariate model, um, you, you should probably include that in your in your paper too because that's really the the value of it. You know, it's a, who cares if odds ratio of uh, of risk factor X is 5 and the odds ratio of something else is 1.2. Uh, I think that the, the model needs to be put together so that you can actually calculate the, the problem for a particular patient that comes along. Um, I think we'll end there. Thank you everyone for a great discussion and a special thank you to our authors and panelists, Dr. Marara, Dr. Disa, and Dr. Nelson. <laughs>